Um, now we come to a different side of the uh, picture, the side of the uh, legal advisors. And we have the special pleasure with us to have Chris Fish. Chris is here. Yes, he is the vice president for the Washington-based government affairs firm McAllister and Queen. And he has a long record in advising government and administration in our area. So we are very much looking forward to your perspective. Just press the arrow down. Yes. Okay. Good. good afternoon. Um, nice to spend some time with you here at InterSolar and Semicon West. And as was described, I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about government incentives for PV panel manufacturing and research and development in terms of what you can secure, not just uh, in terms of the federal government, but I think more so too from uh, state government. And when I say PV panel manufacturing, I mean the vertical supply chain that obviously supports the industry. A um, couple of key points, I think, maybe to make today. First, um, I just want to give you my perspective as someone who spent 15 years in government, both at the congressional level and at the state level, and then also at the political level in terms of working on campaigns, to give you a real sense of how some of these elected officials respond and react in terms of incentives and helping for-profit companies. And with that, um, I think communicating with government officials, how to ask for government assistance, it might sound like a simple topic, but it really isn't. I think that's an important concept for you to consider, and we'll give you some pointers in that area today. Uh, we'll go through some of the federal government incentive sources, what is out there. And again, by incentives, uh, we're talking grants, uh, taxes, loan guarantees. We will talk a little bit about state and local government incentive sources. And I think, again, for states, it's growing more and more as we speak. Um, I want to make the point, too, that government offers incentives to many different industries and technologies, uh, but I do want to couch that with clean tech is the attractive sector for elected officials. You know, when you just open up the newspaper today, look at the front page and see what you see in terms of reports. You know, everyone's talking about clean tech, and you do see manufacturing maybe in a negative light in terms of what's moving offshore. So I think you should keep that uh, perspective in mind. You are in an attractive position politically for elected officials, they are going to want to work with you. Um, communicating uh, with government officials, asking for assistance, I think uh, the point here is there's really two target audiences. There's program managers such as Joanne who just spoke before, uh, and then there's also elected officials and political appointees. And again, I think it's important to distinguish these are two different groups that respond in two different ways. Uh, program managers, uh, you know, these folks are civil servants, they're subject experts, they will definitely understand your technology and the science behind it, and they will want to review it in great detail. Um, they're going to focus on reviewing your technology and your roadmaps and your milestones. These are the folks who get into the weeds in terms of really looking at the technology. On the other side, when you looked at elected officials and political appointees, they're really not going to understand the technology the way Joanne and her folks will. You have to communicate to them in layman terms. They're going to have a very limited understanding in terms of the differences between SIGs and thin film technology. What they're really going to be focused on, both federal and state, is going to be job retention and job creation. That's really what these elected officials are going to be looking at. Um, they will review government incentives to support, uh, at different ways, research and development and manufacturing. So when you meet with elected officials, think in terms of, are we creating jobs? Is a new industry within the state being created? Are we enabling U.S. companies to compete in the global market space? These are the issues that governors respond to, state senators respond to, uh, legislative houses respond to. They want to grow new industries and new technology within the state. Key points with elected officials uh, to continue. Might sound a little bit uh, simple, but temporary or personal politics. Um, you know, you might have a problem with the governor's position on guns or abortion. But what I would say to you is look at the governor as a business partner, as an investor, you know, not as a politician. Think of the governor in terms of on election day, in terms of maybe where you have your personal positions. And you'd be surprised. I've had some high-level CEOs really have difficulty with those issues. But uh, funding's there if you can work with these folks. Uh, state government incentives to assist a company already within the state versus a company conducting a national site selection to locate a $300 million PV panel fab. If uh, you're already within a state and maybe you're not in the clean segment in terms of technology, you're a heavy uh, manufacturer, will your state government help you? Sure. 
But just think politically, what does every governor want? They want a clean tech economy within their state. They want clean tech jobs. They want manufacturing jobs within their state. Point I'm making is if you're going to build a PV panel manufacturing facility, I think you're going to be in a very good position compared to some of the old line manufacturing that might already be in the state. Job retention versus job creation. Um, some of you here in this room might be in states where you are looking maybe to talk to the state about funding, about assistance. Well, if you ask the state for funding and assistance, are you going to retain jobs or are you going to create jobs? Job retention is a good thing. Job creation obviously is a better thing politically in terms of trying to impact the governor or a state legislature. Um, creation of a new industry, a manufacturing cluster. A lot of states look at it uh, this way from an economic development standpoint. If we incentivize one PV company to come and manufacture panels, will more follow? And that's something we'll expand on a little bit later. Um, realistic expectations. I think this is a real important concept. What are you asking for and what will the result of it be? And I'll give you an example. I think Joanne touched on the uh, stimulus. When you look at the stimulus for the Department of Energy, there's about $117 million in it. I've had a lot of folks come to me in terms of consortiums, you know, coming up with projects, you know, about 50 to $60 million in terms of stimulus ask. Well, you have to be realistic in terms of what the government can do, both at the federal level and at the state level. Think of them as a partner. They're not going to be an entity to do everything for you financially. Uh, research and development funding levels versus incentives to build manufacturing facilities. And again, this is both state and federal, but you know, again, in generalization, R&D funding can be at a limited uh, level in terms of a smaller dollar amount versus if you want to build a $300 million facility to manufacture PV panels, you're going to get more money out of a state government in terms of assisting you. Um, two points here, federal government incentives and uh, state and local government incentives in terms of focus points. And again, a generalization, but think of the federal government more to assist you in terms of research and development can they assist you in manufacturing? Absolutely. But I think think of them as R&D, and then the state and local government incentives, think of them as when you want to build an actual factory to build components that go into PV te technology. I think that's where you'll see that the state and local governments provide more funding in terms of assisting you. Uh, federal uh, incentive opportunities within the federal government, give you a couple of uh, examples that we'll go through in terms of areas. I think the RFP process, I think uh, you know, many of you have probably looked at it, but a website, if you're not familiar with it, www.fbo.gov, this is a clearinghouse of all the RFPs that are available through the federal government, not just the Department of Energy, but NIST, the Department of Defense, NASA, et cetera. There's a lot out there, and a lot of technology companies are not just in PV, they're in a lot of different spaces. I think it's worth your time to take a long, hard look at your technology and what opportunities might be out there from the federal government. I do think it's important, too, the last point on this slide, that you do try to target some of these R&D programs, and when possible, you should meet with the program managers before you actually look at an RFP. And it, it sounds as if that's a simple concept, but these RFPs are cumbersome. They take a lot of time, a lot of requirement. They can be 20 to 30 pages or even more in terms of an application process. Vet your technology, explain your technology to these program managers, these subject experts, and see if you really have a project that potentially can fit when an RFP actually does come out and is available. Um, one area I think to touch on, I'm not, not exactly sure in terms of the audience today in terms of the size of your companies, but the federal government does do um, funding uh, specifically for small businesses in terms of technology. And there's two programs, the SBIR program, the STTR program, the Small Business Innovative Research Grant, the Small Business Technology Transfer Grant. Uh, these are R&D programs that are set for every federal agency with an R&D budget. Roughly 2.5% of their budget is set aside to fund these programs specifically for small businesses. The federal government, it varies agency to agency. But a small business, by definition, is roughly under 500 employees. And for this program, uh, from an ownership standpoint, needs to have an organizational ownership of 49% or less in terms of VC or private equity. I bring this up because this program here has basically three phases. One is uh, feasibility, which now is funded at $100,000 and potentially goes up this year to $250,000. And this is basically conceptual feasibility and design of the solution using the technology approach of the proposer. This is more or less you develop a white...